Good evening. James Hancock here. I'm back to count down my top 10 favorite movies by the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock, or as the cool kids like to call him, Hitch. I got this idea thanks to my brother-in-law, who went down a bit of an Alfred Hitchcock rabbit hole recently, which made me realize just how little time I've devoted to celebrating Hitchcock's career, in spite of running my film history podcast, Wrong Reel, for nearly seven years. Well, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, at least I will have made this small tribute to this iconic filmmaker that I love so dearly. And I think sometimes diehard film freaks forget the need to do the obvious, like celebrating Hitchcock, even though so many have already done so in the past. A perfect example being the 2015 documentary Hitchcock Truffaut from director Kent Jones, a documentary, by the way, which gets my highest possible recommendation, as does the original book, which I've got right here. And uh, actually, this is my second copy of the book. The first one fell to pieces. But as obvious and perhaps even redundant as it might seem to my fellow film fanatics to do a video celebrating Hitchcock's work, I feel like now there's more of a need for that than ever before. Because so many media consumers out there live exclusively in the high-octane emotions of the present, so much so that sometimes I feel like our cultural heritage and our history it just disintegrates right before our eyes. So today, I'm going to do my small part to remind folks why Hitchcock is probably the most famous household name in the history of filmmaking. For the last month or so, I've been watching his movies, revisiting many of my favorites, while also addressing a few blind spots. He's a great director for binging. At times, I basically felt drunk with pleasure. But speaking of my blind spots, I saw several of his really early films from the 20s and 30s for the first time, as well as some episodes he directed for his show, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And I still have a few things left to see because I never want this journey to be completely over, but I think I'm able to say with confidence now what my top 10 favorite Hitchcock movies are. And these kinds of lists, they really only matter if you're forced to make some really tough choices. And with Hitch, I could easily create an alternate top 10 list of runner-ups that would still be pretty goddamn impressive. He's one of those rare filmmakers who managed to stay in the game, making movies that people love across six decades from the 1920s through the 1970s. 53 feature films is the official number, but depending upon how you count his shorts and his TV work, you could easily make a case that he directed far more than 53. His impact on TV was just massive. No one will ever hear Funeral March of a Marionette ever again without thinking of Hitchcock's signature profile. And for my taste, his peak is that period from like 1958 to 1960, where he was cranking out some of his best movies, as well as some of his best episodes of his show, which is what led to this incredibly rich vein of movies like Vertigo and North by Northwest and Psycho all in a row. But I'm just as impressed by his work in the 1930s when he was inventing his signature style with classics like the original The Man Who Knew Too Much or The 39 Steps and The Lady Vanishes. And for you film snobs out there, if you want to continue calling yourself a legit hardcore cinephile, you have to see his films from the 1920s, like The Lodger, A Story of the London Fog, as well as Blackmail, which is absolutely fantastic. But I should say from the outset that this video is not intended to be a comprehensive look at his entire career that would take hours. Plus, the documentary Hitchcock Truffaut already has the final word on that front. So if you want to hear great directors like Francois Truffaut, Martin Scorsese, David Fincher, Wes Anderson, Peter Bogdanovich, and many more speak at length about Hitchcock's craft and technique, the movie movie is readily available online. But before I get to my list, I do want to call attention to a few key aspects of his style just so you understand where I'm coming from with my choices. It's crucial for movie freaks to remember that each time we talk about the old movies that we love, there's a chance that someone out there listening is just getting started on their journey and they'll appreciate a little bit of a roadmap. So if I met someone who was a complete and total blank slate on his work, who had never seen a single one of his movies, I would first and foremost emphasize that Hitchcock's movies are glorious entertainment, but created with some of the most sophisticated artistry and technique we've ever seen. When I think of his movies, I think of glamour, style, sophistication, suspense, sex, murder. He never forgot the value of showmanship, even as his artistic ambitions continued to soar deep into his career. He was dismissed as a mere entertainer for so much of his career, as if that's a bad thing. And I find it hysterical that the critics of his day were shocked and amazed when directors of the French New Wave started calling attention to Hitchcock as one of their favorite filmmakers. It's further evidence that in any era, most critics are completely incapable of experiencing pleasure. But the French New Wave directors, they understood that when it comes to the magic of movies, using the tricks and tools of the trade and constructing a story, Hitchcock was a master. And he kept getting better in stages throughout his career. Using the technicians and resources of Hollywood's Golden Age studio system, Hitchcock's experiments with the language of cinema are basically the essence of what the magic of movie making is all about. But if I were to try to zero in on one ingredient that separates Hitch from his peers, I think he's the best there ever was at capturing a world where the idle rich seem to spend all their time plotting elaborate ways to kill one another in between games of tennis and glasses of champagne. And that's an oversimplification, obviously. Hitchcock worked on many different kinds of stories, but at his best, Hitchcock presents us a world of pure, raw cinema where emotion is everything, while logic and plausibility increasingly feel totally unimportant.
It's a world that fills me with this like mischievous demonic glee, in part because he just seems to be having so much fun hamming up his master of ceremonies, indulging in his justifiably famous cameos in most of his movies, or making his hysterical opening and closing remarks in the episodes to his show. And when it comes to Gallo's humor, I'm not sure he has an equal. In person, he's one of the funniest people in the history of the movie biz. The best example I can think of is his trailer to Psycho, where he walks us through the set of the movie teasing the story that he has in store for us, but then acting as if the details are too shocking to describe, or the way he announced in advertisements for the film that no one would be admitted after the film began. But of course, the audience ate it up, wondering what the hell the fuss was all about. But before I go any further, I do need to give credit to some of his key collaborators, without whom his career might have gone in a very different direction. And the most obvious examples are actors like Cary Grant or Grace Kelly and Jimmy Stewart, who he worked with many times, but over the years, Hitchcock also assembled a murderer's row of wildly talented individuals behind behind the camera, each of whom left their fingerprints on his best movies. For wardrobe, you have the legendary Edith Head famously said, your dresses should be tight enough to show you're a woman and loose enough to show you're a lady. Or Robert Burks, who shot 11 of his movies, including iconic films like Vertigo. Or Saul Bass, who delivered Hitch's most memorable title sequences in movies like North by Northwest. And then you have what might be my favorite composer in the history of movie making, Bernard Herrmann, and last but certainly not least, you have his family. Hitchcock's wife, Alma Revel, aka Lady Hitchcock. She was a screenwriter and an editor who worked with Hitchcock basically his entire career. And on his sets, the best praise Hitchcock could offer to any crew member when talking about the work was to say, Alma loved it. And of course, they eventually added their daughter Patricia to the mix, who in Psycho delivers one of the funniest lines out of all of Hitchcock's movies. He was flirting with you. I guess he must have noticed my wedding ring. But I've been talking quite a bit at this point, and my voice is already starting to get hoarse, so it's time to roll up my sleeves and get into this. And just to give you an idea of how tough this was for me, here are the movies that did not make the list, and these are all movies that I love dearly. Many of which I've seen several times. Movies like Lifeboat, The Birds, Blackmail, Rebecca, To Catch a Thief, Marnie, Dial M for Murder, Sabotage, The Lodger, both versions of The Man Who Knew Too Much, and many episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, like the very first episode, Revenge, starring Hitchcock regular Vera Miles, that episode still packs a massive punch to the present day. But for my number 10, I'm going to start with Rope from 1948, starring Hitchcock's frequent collaborator, the great Jimmy Stewart. It's probably most famous for its use of very long takes to enhance the illusion of the entire story taking place in real time. Reels of film back then had their limits, basically 10 minutes, so Hitchcock was forced to disguise his transitions from one reel to the next. But that technical innovation, it's not the most interesting aspect of the film for me. For my money, this is one of Hitch's most sinister explorations of the mind of a killer, or in the case of this movie, two killers who look at murder as an art form to be explored by superior beings. We see them in the very first scene, murdering someone they know, whereupon they hide the body in plain view and proceed to host a party around it, constantly wondering aloud to their guests where their missing friend might be. It's a fantastic hook for a story, especially once they're confronted by the very person who introduced them to the concept of Nietzsche's super being in the first place, namely Jimmy Stewart, who eventually becomes shocked and horrified when he sees what kind of people his former students have become. My one complaint is that the movie feels a little bit stagey, which makes sense because it was first to play in 1929, but otherwise I find this film to be delicious, and it would lead to three more collaborations between Hitch and Jimmy Stewart in the future, but number nine, The 39 Steps. If you've ever seen a movie in your life where a suave gentleman and a beautiful lady are on the run trying to stop a vast conspiracy that only they know about, would well, probably ripped off massive chunks of this movie, even if the filmmakers were unaware that they were consciously doing so. Even Hitchcock ripped off this format a few times, giving us many variations on this theme throughout his career, most famously with a film that is ranked much higher on my list. But this is one of the earliest examples of Hitchcock at the height of his powers as a storyteller whipping out one dazzling technique after after another, like when a woman discovers a dead body, turns to the camera to scream, but we only hear the shriek of a train whistle. These devices and tricks have often been imitated, but in the hands of Hitchcock, the movie still feels as fresh and new as the day it was first released. Hitchcock regarded it as one of his personal favorites of his career, and it's easy to understand why. The movie gives us colorful, maniacal villains, late night encounters with mysterious, beautiful women, and plenty of murder and mayhem, all while Hitchcock serves up one great twist after another. It's a strong contender for my favorite movie he made in the 1930s, but that honor belongs to the next movie on my list, so number eight, The Lady Vanishes. Looking back on the thrillers that he made in the 1930s, it's easy to see the brewing tensions in Europe and the inevitable war right on the horizon, but at the time of this movie's release, 
The British Board of Film Censors would not allow the foreign villains to be specified as Germans. In any event, this unforgettable movie, one that Orson Welles saw 11 times, is one of Hitchcock's best examples I can think of, where he's able to sustain tension and suspense for an agonizing length of time, all while keeping the story wildly entertaining, light, and enjoyable. I should add that Hitchcock drew a clear distinction between surprise and suspense, and I'm paraphrasing here, but surprise is when a bomb goes off beneath the table where two people are sitting. Suspense is when the audience knows that the bomb is there and is waiting in anticipation for the inevitable to occur. But here we have a situation where an English tourist meets what seems like a nice sweet old lady who suddenly disappears on a train ride. And the tourist is surrounded by all these suspicious characters, all pretending as if the woman never existed. Yet we, the audience, know the tourist is speaking the truth as she turns the train upside down and surprise, surprise, uncovers this vast, intricate, and diabolical plot. And what I love most about this movie is how it invests an enormous amount of time up front into clearly defining all the major characters, making us all the more invested, all while Hitchcock is teasing us with all these little hints and clues about what's to come, making the film well worth revisiting many times over. Also, the ending is just a blast. It's refreshingly patriotic and exhilarating, and I end up having just a fantastic time every time that I revisit the movie. And while we're on the subject of political thrillers, let's get into my number seven, Notorious, starring the legendary Cary Grant, Ingrid Bergman, and Claude Rains. This might be the most sophisticated and emotionally complex love story of Hitchcock's career, with a brilliant love triangle between the three leads, where Grant is encouraging Bergman to seduce Claude Rains' character in order to infiltrate a group of Nazis hiding out in Brazil after World War II. And of course, Cary Grant's already madly in love with Bergman, making his feelings toward the mission much more difficult to wrestle with. And speaking of Grant and Bergman, Hitch shot one really lengthy kissing scene that was incredibly awkward to film from a technical standpoint, but one that pays off big time on the screen. Hitchcock later joked to Truffaut that he was essentially giving the audience a menage a trois with his two beautiful leads. But I should add that if someone says Notorious is their favorite film by Hitchcock, I have absolutely no problem with that. We're getting to the part of my list where all the films are really good, but what I love most about this film is watching how versatile Hitchcock can be with his camera, perhaps most famously with this elaborate crane shot that moves in from this great height looking over a party, just moving in tighter, 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 until finally it stops on the key held in Bergman's hand, a key that's essential to the plot. And I should say that Hitch is the undisputed master of shooting key props and items in the plot in the most fetishistic manner possible. And it's these kinds of visual flourishes that have earned him his reputation as a superb visual storyteller many times over. But moving on to number six, I've got Shadow of a Doubt from 1943. I can't say for sure how many times I've seen this movie, but it's a strong contender for the Hitchcock movie that I have revisited the greatest number of times. I love everything about it. And in hindsight, when you look at his filmography as a whole, Shadow of a Doubt for me is basically his first quintessentially American movie, specifically the small town of Santa Rosa, California. For those who don't know, Hitchcock was lured to Hollywood in 1940 by producer David O. Selznick to make Rebecca. And while today a lot of filmmakers feel the urge to get away from the studio system, back then Hitchcock had the reverse impulse because he knew that the studios at that time had the best technicians anywhere in the world, these highly skilled craftsmen who would help him deliver all these bold visions experiments. Also, Shadow of a Doubt features one of my all-time favorite actors, Orson Welles' regular Joseph Cotton, as the Merry Widow murderer, who is hiding out with his sister's family. His niece, Charlie, feels this intense, almost psychic rapport with her uncle, which only enhances her sense of horror as she gets wise to who he really is. But as great as their relationship might be, what always gets me is the subplot of two eccentric old crime buffs played by Henry Travers and Hume Cronin, who seem to spend all their time plotting and scheming the best ways to kill each other. Their conversations are absolutely sublime and really get to the core of what I love most about Hitchcock's movies. But <laughs> without further delay, let's move on to my number five, Strangers on a Train. here on out, I don't think any of my choices will be considered particularly controversial, but some fans might push back on the order in which I present them. But Strangers on a Train, it's a pivotal movie in terms of my falling in love with Hitchcock back in college. I was already on my way to becoming a film history fanatic, and I'd seen Psycho, but I'll admit that I was struggling to understand as an undergrad what was the big deal about this so-called master of suspense. And then randomly, my friends and I, we just threw in the VHS cassette for this movie, not for a class or for any pretentious reason. We were just craving some good old-fashioned entertainment, and the movie 100% delivered. Primarily because this movie gives us my favorite villain out of all of Hitchcock's movies, the great Bruno Antony, played by Robert 
Robert Walker, who would sadly die the following year. But here we have the ultimate lovable, deranged psychopath who dreams up the perfect way to get rid of his father by swapping murders with the famous tennis player Guy Haynes, who is having trouble getting a divorce. Never mind the fact that the tennis player thinks that Bruno's joking. Bruno pushes forward with the plan all the same, giving us this beautifully eerie murder sequence that is absolutely seared into my brain. But it's just one of many astonishing details about this movie. We have the extraordinary cross-cutting between Guy's tennis match and Bruno's efforts to reclaim a lighter from down in the sewer, breaking about every law of physics in the process. And we had the hallucinatory merry-go-round battle that feels like something cooked up by a James Bond villain. But best of all, by far from me, is watching Bruno at a cocktail party, casually discussing murder techniques with two old ladies, one of whom foolishly allows Bruno to put his hands around her throat to prove a point. This is one of those movies that I can watch pretty much any time and have an absolute blast. And at last, we arrive at my one choice where I'm expecting some massive pushback. I have Vertigo at number four, and I'm well aware that many diehard film freaks out there regard it as the finest film ever made. I have no trouble calling it one of the finest movies ever made, but it isn't necessarily the Hitchcock film I always feel like watching if I'm looking to have a good time. I think this dreamlike story is easily his most ambitious film, the most mysterious, the most implausible, but in a good way, and the most beautiful from a photographic standpoint. The title sequence alone by Saul Bass makes me drool with pleasure. And most interesting to me is how the movie completely lays bare some of Hitchcock's biggest perversions and fetishes, getting into some pretty disturbing terrain for the 1950s. As Hitchcock famously said to Truffaut, to put it plainly, the man wants to go to bed with a woman who is dead. And much to her credit, Kim Novak, she was totally game for this deranged story and more than earned herself a place right alongside the many stunning platinum blondes that Hitchcock worked with over the years, including but not limited to... Grace Kelly, Ava Marie Saint, Janet Leigh, and Tippi Hedren. But in spite of the movie's many impressive attributes, it ain't exactly the fastest movie I've ever laid eyes on. This is one of those movies where I really have to be in the mood for it before I can kind of surrender and give myself over to its rhythms. What's incredible, though, is how this movie was out of circulation for several decades, right alongside Rope, Rear Window, The Trouble with Harry, and the 1956 version of The Man Who Knew Too Much. In the 1970s, film fans like Martin Scorsese and Paul Schrader, they would search far and wide even to see a crummy, beat-up 16mm print, which I think definitely helped play a role in the subsequent fetishization of the movie by its admirers. And who knows, as the years go by and I continue to study this film, it may climb the ranks, but it's going to be tough to dethrone the next three movies, all of which I regard as the gold standard of Alfred Hitchcock's style of storytelling. So let's get into the unholy trinity of my top three Hitchcock flicks, starting with number three, North by Northwest. Now, Vertigo famously underperformed at the box office, so Hitchcock had to bounce back, and he did so very deliberately with a movie that seems to have been engineered to deliver maximum pleasure to the viewer each and every second of the entire movie. There are a million reasons to be in awe of this movie. A lot of folks like it for just how influential it was on the James Bond franchise, which was right around the corner. Because you have exotic death traps and colorful villains, beautiful double agents, sinister henchmen, this movie's got it all. But it also has Cary Grant in what might be the best role of his career, stumbling and bumbling his way through this wild plot after being mistaken for a secret agent who does not in fact exist. And watching Cary Grant in jail explaining to his mother over the phone how he was force-fed bourbon by the villains in pursuit of him, it just makes me howl every time, and for me it's just one of those movies where I'd find myself just laughing uproariously, perhaps even obnoxiously, at every scene, no matter what the scene might be trying to achieve. From the moment the movie begins with Saul Bass' classic title sequence, to the very end with that naughtily suggestive shot of a train entering a tunnel as Cary Grant and Ava Marie Saint enjoy their wedding night, this is one of those movies that just hurtles along at this breakneck pace, in large part due to Bernard Herrmann's score, which is so pulse-pounding, it could wake the dead from their graves. It also doesn't hurt that one of the best screenwriters in Hollywood history, Ernest Lehman, served up one great scene after another. None better than what might be the best seduction sequence ever committed to film as Ava Marie Saint swoops in and pounces on Cary Grant while he's hiding from the authorities on a train. And I still haven't mentioned the most famous sequence, the crop duster sequence. And I think the best bit is actually before the plane attacks. When we see Cary Grant dropped off in the middle of nowhere, it's perfectly flat, there's nowhere to run, and the sense of building suspense is just delicious to behold. So for my number two, the only way I can top one of the most entertaining movies ever made is by singing the praises of what is a strong contender for the most important horror movie of the 20th century, Psycho. Now, it's really hard to say anything about this movie that has not been said many times before by far more eloquent people, but it's no exaggeration to say that Psycho changed movies 
forever. Here we are 60 years later, and people still imitate those horrible shrieking sounds anytime someone pretends like they're stabbing anything with a knife. Bernard Harmon's musical contributions, they really can't be overstated. And one of my favorite stories about this movie is one shared by Peter Bogdanovich, where he describes a screening of the movie where you could just hear one long, sustained, horrified scream from the entire audience throughout the entirety of the shower sequence. I love hearing that shit. So many movies, unfortunately, feel designed to put us to sleep or to reinforce our complacency, fatigue, boredom, you name it. Psycho is the opposite. In spite of being the 49th film by a 61-year-old filmmaker, this movie was designed just to be a lightning bolt straight to the middle of your forehead, and holy shit, it worked. On a budget of roughly $800,000, it earned $50 million. It's still making money to the present day, and that's because there's so much to love about this movie. I love how intensely erotic the early scenes are between Janet Lee and her lover. I love the claustrophobia and paranoia of the driving sequences as she hightails it out of town, nervously avoiding the police, before finally pulling up on a rainy night to the most fucked up motel on the surface of the planet. But in spite of all the violence and the mounting dread, the movie's weirdly comical, like when Norman Bates is trying to bury the evidence of his crimes by sinking a car into the muck. And for a brief moment, it stops sinking, and we're all like, oh no, Like, what's he going to do? At that point, Hitch is basically making us an accomplice to the crime. And the movie certainly has flaws, but they don't even really matter. I don't really need the explanation at the end of the film, and if I'm being honest, once Janet Lee is dead, my interest in the film starts to deflate. And don't get me wrong, killing off the lead character in such a fashion is as bold as it gets from a storytelling standpoint, but the movie is at its best when she and Anthony Perkins are just having their eerie conversation. But I'm getting carried away, so let's move on to my number one, which should come as no surprise to any Hitchcock fan. I have Rear Window. There are very few movies out there that I would describe as irresistible, but Rear Window, it's one of them. A movie that over the years has come to be interpreted, quite rightly, as one of the best movies ever made about the act of watching movies. If you're a film freak like me, we have to acknowledge that voyeurism is at the core of our obsession. As Thelma Ritter's character declares in this film, we've become a race of peeping toms. And in the end, cinephiles spend thousands of hours alone in the dark, watching much more attractive people and much more interesting people enjoy a heightened level of experience that we will rarely, if ever, experience ourselves. Selves. And while there have been many movies to explore this theme over the years, movies like Brian De Palma's Body Double, it's tough to imagine any movie ever surpassing Rear Window on this front. But even if you toss out all that pretentious nonsense, Rear Window is just pure, raw, hedonistic pleasure to watch from start to finish. If you love film aesthetics, the movie's a masterclass in craft and technique. From a visual storytelling standpoint, this movie is endlessly rewatchable. As much as I might enjoy the murder mystery at the core, when I watch the movie now, I'm obsessively savoring all the little details of the people that live just beyond Jimmy Stewart's window. I love how each little narrative has its own arc and payoff, my favorite being the frustrated composer, at one point seeing chilling with Hitch himself, and how slowly but surely over the course of the movie, he breathes life into the piece that he's been struggling with. Or you have the story of Miss Lonely Heart, which might be the saddest and most moving plot seen in any Hitchcock movie. But there's no use beating around the bush. This movie is the Grace Kelly and Jimmy Stewart show. The glamour of Grace Kelly reaches dizzying heights in this film. And part of what makes this movie so much fun is watching this Park Avenue socialite getting wrapped up and invested in solving this crime right alongside this photographer that she's fallen in love with. This is just a first-rate movie from start to finish, and I think in many ways it is Hitchcock's signature movie where all of his obsessions and techniques they're all placed on full display for us to enjoy, and I'm very confident that I'll continue to revisit this film with a big giant smile on my face for many, many years to come. So that's my list. Every time I do one of these top 10 lists, I vow that I need to do a lot more of them, and this time I mean it. But it's one of those things where when I think of a top 10 list, I'm like, oh, that'll take like five minutes. I can crank that out of my sleep. And then like it takes months to do all the research and preparation and getting all the clips together. In any event, I want to do more of these in the future. I particularly want to do one on the James Bond franchise ahead of No Time to Die. And I still have so many legendary filmographies that I want to tackle, including one of my all-time favorite directors, Howard Hawks, who by some strange coincidence has also been horribly neglected by my podcast, Wrong Real. But I can't thank you enough for listening to Moran on this topic. I look forward to hearing people's reactions and their own top 10 rankings of Hitchcock movies. But if you enjoyed this video and you would like to hear more, please consider subscribing to the channel as well as checking out my podcast, Wrong Real. And you can always find me on Twitter at Geeking Out and at Wrong Real. But thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards. Holy moly.